you always know where to go back and look. <coughs> so let's take a quick look at this and see how we did. Now, I did ask you not to write on this, and people still wrote on this. No, I'm sorry. I, so I can kind of use them again, but some of them. But you did well. So, so. So, this one take talk about these. Are there any questions? Are you to give one either? So get to me. We're gonna add one more so We have I have four of these practice tests for the different arrows. So we're gonna do four of them all on the same sheet. And so here, back to this. If you get over 20, correct, that's great. And this will hopefully teach you areas where you're you know not sure about, you need to go back and look at, especially like when you have that cartoon about Andrew Jackson. You'll call him a king and using the veto, you're like, I can't remember any of that. Now you know where to go back. So you can buy this with the review packet. And it really does give you some good information, help you study. Okay, what's your question? I can more. Anything else? Ooh, 24, I will, because I care about you. So 24 is. Okay, so this is David Potter. By the way, that's a, it's a, that's a really good book, The Impending Crisis. Yeah, it's, a, it's really a good book. I like Potter. Really focus on the uh, political side of that. So. Potter's talking about this, and you say 24? Yes. Okay, when it says the acquisition of a new empire, you know, Potter's talking about the expansion of slavery and how about the balance of states, you know, the state balance and senatorial balance. Well, this new empire, what he's referring to is the expansion of slavery westward, like a slave empire. Yeah, taxes, new all that. And so for 24, the answer would be the renewed debate over the expansion of slavery. Are we going to expand westward for more slave states? And so that's what that's talking about. And there's some other ones that might work, but but extension of trade towards Asia. And since he's talking about slavery, that doesn't make much sense. The anti-immigrant immigrant sentiment, yes, that did exist, but that doesn't really fit in with the document at all. You're talking about it's talking about the issues leading up to the Civil War. And the decline of the Democratic Party. Well, the Democratic Party was becoming more of a southern pro-slavery party, so that kind of doesn't fit in. So that's why that one works. Any other ones we're not sure about? Not to keep Any other ones? So let's look at 19 really quick. 19, there's a cartoon about Andrew Jackson, and it's talking about he was the first president to use the veto. <laughs> Someone handed this in, that's period, and they wrote on top, do not write on this. <laughs> they wrote on it, do not write on. This won't be on top. Just another practice. Just to have. You're fine. So with that, so the thing is this. Here he is, he's standing on the Constitution. He's the first president to use the veto for a, a lot of purposes. The brand new Whig Party, or soon to be called the Whigs, looked at him like some kind of dictator or like a king. And so this is anti-Jackson. It's an anti-Jackson, did I give you this? Okay, so this anti-Jackson, would you have yours? Yes, we need them all. And, and so all of those is looking for which one would actually be pro-Jackson and not like this cartoon. And so it would make sense that it'd be the Western farmers, you know, those who hated the bank. But my guess, a lot of people missed that, but I thought it was kind of weirdly written. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, the picture shows the king using the veto, but didn't the Whigs want to put like a dictator to try to get him? No, they, well, they wanted to keep with him with the aristocracy. They wanted the aristocracy, sure, but they didn't want to keep with Jackson. So, they're going to use something in front of the game. Jackson with that. So it isn't so much about what they want, it's a way to discredit Jackson. Okay. Which is pretty possible. You know, just, just find something we can attack on. We're always acting like a king. Even though they didn't want the uh, elite to win. Any others on this? So people did pretty well on this, it looks like. Feel pretty good about this one? Yes. Hmm? 
Well, the thing about it is it's a combination of maybe the questions are written easier, but you get more used to it. And it's becoming more familiar when you go back and review. And don't forget, if there's an area you don't know, let's say like that Jack's one, you don't remember that, go back to your notes, the review packet. But the big thing is that review book. It has a section on that, and it has eight or nine multiple choice questions for every unit. The key is on my webpage, in the re on the AP review section. So you can go back and look at that. There's also samples for short answer questions. You can go back and just think about how you would answer that. You know, the big thing about that is you're not necessarily have to write it. We've done a lot of those kind of things. The big thing is, okay, how am I going to answer? Just think about it. That's all you got to do. It will help you review. The review book should help you a lot. And there's other samples, including, let's make a trade. Turn up the ones you didn't write on. Okay. This will not hurt you. Oh, yeah. So, and so hand those up, and here's the next one due on Monday. Do you like these? Just do it on the same sheet, so I will give you. So turn up the ones, and I'll trade you. It like you. That's why we can't have nice <laughs> I'm for president. Yes. That would be pretty funny if it happened. Like a still. That would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so same deal on Monday. You'll notice though this. I need another one. This is the next section. So now we're moving into the post reconstruction era. So post reconstruction all the way through. There might be from 1980 on, there might be probably three questions at the most on the test, supposedly. And one of the short answer questions will be, you have a choice. One will be like from 1960 on, and one might be from, from before 1783. You have a choice between those two. That's actually kind of nice. Yeah. The other three you have to do, and the DBQ will be in between basically the event from 1763 through 1980. So that's where we go in the most detail. Like we'll finish up with 1980 in here in detail in class. Before the test. And for the essay question, you have three choices. Last year, we had two. Aren't you guys cool? Hmm? Probably something to do with American history. And so with that, let's go to, no, I have no idea what's going to happen. I, I can look at, they actually sent out the essay questions, but the multiple choice I don't know. What were the essay questions? In fact, my plan was on a review session to show you those. Oh, okay. But one was on the events, the DBQ was on the events leading up to the Revolutionary War. Okay. That was actually a pretty good one. Yeah. And, I'll show them when we do a review. I'll talk about it. Yeah, the review dates, and it's going to be. I'm looking about this is a Sunday, and that's a Wednesday, and like around 4 30 or 5. I'll get the exact time. I got to do it in the evening just because that's after this week, after the activities are on six. You ready to snack? All right, so let's go take a note. Where are we finishing at? Will we in South Vietnam? We get the Dinh Ben Phu. Yeah. Yeah. Did I mention LBJ wanted to use nuclear weapons? Yeah. 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 LBJ actually talked to Lyndon Johnson. Not LBJ. Did I say LBJ? Yeah. Eisenhower. LBJ said no, which is ironic. LBJ, and we'll find out probably next Monday or Tuesday, is the president who sent troops in. And. We got to set where we are going to travel day and night for the Okay, so. Oh, 
So, real fast, in Iran, who was the leader of Iran who nationalized the oil? Mossadegh. And what do you call the unintended consequences of covert actions that would lead to yeah, blowback? And we can see all the way to what happened in Iraq, to ISIS, to Afghanistan. It's actually a remarkable thing. What country did they, that President Arbenz try to, to do land reform? Yeah, Guatemala. And who would come in again? <laughs> Honduras is where they go. Oh, Honduras is where the CIA is uh, What kind of government did the CIA put in both places? <laughs> oh, who did the United States try to appeal to? What kind of people in the Mideast to be anti-communists? Yeah, fundamentalist Muslims. That will be, have serious consequences down the road. Especially when they found out that they, they were just being used by the United States, they'd be really mad. Guys like, what guy did we help get to Afghanistan? Uh, yeah, who felt like he's being used for American politics. Yeah. So we already got Ho Chi Minh, right? We, we're here. We're here. No, we're, we're, you should have been here. Oh, we're in the siege, right? Yeah, right here. So that's the siege. The siege ended. Did we get to this at all? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, they collapsed and the French surrendered. This would be one of the most famous pictures in Vietnam today. Dien Bin Phu. Dien, no more Dien Bin Phu. Dien Bin Phu. That's actually a pretty good shot of the parachutes. You can see the you can see the rip cord pulling the. Okay. Well, the, no, the right here? Yeah. That's a Dien Bien Phu. That's after the French surrendered, and there's a Viet Minh waving the Viet Minh flag, which is now the flag of Vietnam. And there's the French surrendered, and that would be the end. The French realized they could no longer hold French Indochina. And they, remember, they wanted out, but the U.S. was kind of pushing them to stay in. And so the French wanted out, and that would lead to a 1955. The Geneva Accords. That's where the League of Nations were. So they had a lot of big buildings. Geneva, Switzerland. Well, the Geneva Accords, they basically, the French left, they're now independent, four countries. But two of the countries, North and South, and VN or VNM are, are pretty common nick or uh, abbreviations for Vietnam. North and South Vietnam would have elections to unify them in 56. So there's going to be a grace period of a year because they're really worried that all the like people who helped the French, there might be reprisals against them. So a lot of people who are kind of scared of Ho Chi Minh went to the south. The French actually had more control down there. And then the north, that was where Hull was. But in 56, there'll be an election to unify north and south. The problem was the United States was completely and totally opposed to this. There's John Foster Dulles talking about it, literally in 1955, about what a bad deal this was. Not only do the communists have a big victory, but secretly they all knew one very important thing. If there was an election for the North and South to unify it under one government, Ho Chi Minh and his government would win, without a doubt. He was the hero of Vietnam. He's the one who led the fight to kick the French out. He beat the colonial power. Ho would win. And be one Vietnam under Ho. And the US could not tolerate that. So they convinced the new government in Saigon, South Vietnam, to and they nixed the elections, no elections. So they just simply said the North would cheat, the elections would not be free, therefore, no elections. This would be the beginning of the Vietnam War, right here. No elections. Pretty big moment in history. So the United States, they violated the, the accords, and our goal became this. The goal, we wanted an independent South Vietnam. Or another way to look at it, we want two Vietnams. North then, that could be under whole, but the U.S. wants an anti-communist government in South Vietnam. Two Vietnams. The Vietnam War is about this. The U.S. wants a South Vietnam. 
the vast majority of Vietnamese want one. So a very compliant dictator would be named. Actually, he wasn't that compliant. <laughs> and uh, Nguyen Zem. Yeah, the Vietnamese language, the French, you know, butchered it to turn the Latin letters, 10,000 some Vietnamese characters into 26 letters. So that is pronounced either a duh, there's also could be an N, it could be a G, it could be a Y, or it could be a TZ. <laughs> so his name is actually Zell. Do you think of how weird it is for the English language? And think of how hard the Vietnamese language would be for English speakers. Or French speakers, for that matter. And we claimed it was a democracy, but he was a dictator. This is another abbreviation, SBN, in South Vietnam. He'd be another dictator. There he is meeting Eisenhower. There he is for Newsweek, and it's like holding Southeast Asia from the commies. I thought that was a pretty good cover. And they became a member of CETO. Remember CETO? That was part of the Pax. We had CETO, CETO, and what's the biggie in Europe? Which, no, that's the only one that still exists. And he, from day one, had troubles. He was a Catholic in a majority Buddhist country, and that made Zem look like he was still collaborating with the French, because the French are mostly Catholic. And he turned out to be very corrupt, gave powerful positions to family members who got rich off of it. And it was clear that we're kind of backing a pretty corrupt, unpopular dictator, but he's all we got. And almost immediately, those who wanted one Vietnam began to revolt, and the Civil War began in South Vietnam. Almost immediately. By 1960, Ho Chi Minh in the north, actually it wasn't horrible, was it's called that, he helped, he kind of led the initiative to organize those southern guerrillas into the National Liberation Front. And so the north had a lot of control over it, but it, they are still southerners. So this was a civil war. The North did send some aid, and they sent a lot of political officers to try to indoctrinate them. These are National Liberation Front NLF members, dressed as peasants. The, the US always said they look like they're wearing black pajamas with a hodgepodge of weapons, as guerrillas would have. Now, Zem is no dummy. He knew he had to scare the United States, so he called them the Viet Cong. For Vietnamese communists. And that's where the term Viet Cong comes from. My guess is a lot of you probably heard that term. That's where it comes from. It's the same thing as a National Liberation Front. Did you have a question? Um, so the NLF was from the North because they were fighting. It, think of it as they're actually Southerners, but that is the North trying to control. Okay. So the North kind of set up this headquarters apparatus so they could control that civil war in the South. Okay. But they're, at least at first, they were all Southern. Southerners fighting against the Zen government. Yeah. Be like calm, like be like be calm. That's incredible. Like be calm and autonomous. Because it's kind of a, a bastardization of the Vietnamese word for calm. So calm. But I see what you're saying. This was not in English. They just called the Vietnamese communists in the in, in Vietnamese, and then it was translated to that. And that's the Viet Cong flag, very similar to the um Viet Minh and now Vietnamese flag to have the blue for the South. And Civil War. By 1959, the Viet Cong, or I'll call them either one, or the NLF of the Viet Cong, they were winning. And the US began to send millions of dollars of aid. And the first advisors came in 1959. Advisors are American soldiers that are there to train the South Vietnamese Army. And some were flying this brand new weapon called helicopters. And the first American to die, therefore, in this civil war in South Vietnam that we all lumped together as the Vietnam War, the civil war in South Vietnam, 1959. The first Americans. Because they were, you know, they were training South Vietnamese troops that go out into the jungle and then they ran the. And one more, yeah. Was it necessary for them to actually? The United States? If the United States would not have pumped in millions of dollars and then eventually hundreds of thousands of troops, South Vietnam, their government would have fallen by 61 or 62. And Vietnam would have been unified by them. So, in other words, you could just save thousands of 
Without her, the United States lost just under 60,000, but maybe 3 million Vietnamese. Yeah, the U.S., by them getting involved, stretched this war on to 1975. The vast majority of the population wanted one Vietnam. So, yeah. And the reason the U.S. got involved had very little to do with Vietnam itself. It was a cold war. It was what cold happened war. to the U.S. at night? They didn't. Just like what happened now. No. But remember, if you believe the domino theory, then it would spread to Indonesia, Philippines, and then where? Wyoming. Wyoming, yes. <laughs> so that's actually a good question. This was, but as it turns out, situation in Wyoming is significantly different than the situation in South Vietnam. Wow. I know to a lot of you that like, no, it can't be. So while this is going on, this the world was changing really fast. There was full-scale war that started with what's called the Suez Crisis that turned into the Sinai War. So this is Egypt, the brand new country of Israel, Jordan, right here's the Suez Canal. And a very important strategic location, as you can imagine, the British and French built this canal, basically stole the toll money from Egypt. Egypt finally got its independence after World War II. And a new nationalist who followed Mossadegh, Gamir Nasser, the Nasser government, he was a national, he's a dictator. This is not a democracy, he's a dictator. He nationalized the canal. Nasser nationalized, sorry about that. So they could get the toll money from ships going through the canal. He wanted to modernize Egypt. For example, they built this massive dam on the Nile called the, and the Aswan High Dam. They thought the hydro liquid power will go into the 20th century. It was a disaster. It did not work at all the way they thought. But Britain and France were furious. Remember, France now, they're humiliated by French Indochina, still humiliated from World War II. Britain is losing their empire. They are a shadow of their former self after years of war and being broke after the war. And so they said, we can't allow this to happen. What else are we going to lose? And one more thing. Remember that brand new country of Israel. Israel was created in 1948. They won their war of independence. Now, this was all part of the Ottoman Empire. After World War I, the British made a mandate called Palestine. People who wanted an independent Israeli state called Zionists. Many of them, Europe and the United States, started to immigrate, immigrate to Palestine. And they actually did a number of terrorist acts to try to break away against the British. But after World War II, they became almost a desperate goal to get an independent state of Israel. I think we know why, what happened in World War II. And a big reason why they were desperate to do this is because nobody cared what happened in the countries itself. They were totally ignored. Totally. So they thought, we better do it ourselves. So they basically went in there into what is now what was in Palestine. And when the British left in 47, they fought a, basically a civil war there and they won, creating Israel. But they always felt vulnerable. And Arabs around them always looked at them as European colonists, European uh, imperialists. It's more complex than that, but that's where they look at it. I gotta be clear about this. Israel really only had one ally in the 1950s. Anyone know who? No. The United States was not an ally of Israel. The United States was actually relatively anti Israel because the United States wanted France in the Arab world to contain communism. So we wanted friends like in Jordan or Syria or Iraq. Their only ally was France. And France was an ally because they were guilty because they helped participate in the final solution in France during World War II after they were conquered. Remember the Vichy government and all that? So they felt vulnerable. If you would have said, let's say this was a classroom in 1964, and I would have said, we're going to talk about the Holocaust, and nobody would have had any idea what I was talking about. Nobody. Ten years later, they would have known. It was like all of a sudden, it was like this kind of... Uh, it, it was kind of uh, this kind of proactive or reactive guilt. We felt really bad then, also, we brought it out and it became known. 
it's actually really kind of amazing how everyone tried to forget and all of a sudden they remember. It, it's odd to me. If you go to Washington, D.C., there's a, and a lot a lot of cities have a Holocaust Museum. That's, that's 1991. That's not that long ago. So that's kind of a retroactive guilt going down. Yeah. So with that, all three of them, feeling bond, think about Israel. We have enemies all over, and Nasser is talking like he's going to reestablish this great Arab state. All three of them got together in cahoots. Israel did a preemptive attack against Egypt in the Sinai. And Britain and France, they came in to defend the canal because of the war. So what that means is all three attacked Egypt at once. They all attacked Egypt, took the canal. Now, the thing about this was, Soviets were mad, but nobody was more angry than Eisenhower and the United States. They were furious with Britain, France, and Israel. They didn't particularly like Nasser, but they were worried that if Britain, France, and Israel do this, the United States will have a hard time getting allies in the Middle East. And so, in a big moment, the Eisenhower administration made it very clear to all three of these countries, you will pull out or we will cut back on aid. And they pulled out. And that showed, that's really, you can see the moment where the United States truly became a superpower. Britain and France, before, before World War I, could do anything they wanted. Because of the war, they'd lost so much power that they became second-rate powers. This directly would lead to the European Union. We better start getting together for a relatively small country alone. And Israel is going to feel even more threatened. A decade later would be the most important war to happen in the Middle East since World War I, the Six Day War. Some of you might have heard of that. Kind of a big battle. We'll get to that a little bit in a decade. Yeah. Change the world. So with this, while this is going on, the Soviets were having some problems. Same exact time in Hungary. The Hungarian people rose up and ousted a Stalinist, brutal dictatorship, a police state that was even worse than Stalin's state. And in 1950, the Soviet Union reestablished the terror within the Soviet Union, focused mostly on Jews, but others too. And the thing about Hungary right here, this is a protest, this is they toppled the statue of Stalin. And that's a pretty good picture. You can tell they toppled it face first. See the nose all crushed. If you ever go to France and like at Versailles, they have all the statues of Versailles. And during the French Revolution, they knocked them down. And so then they propped them back up, and all the statues have broken noses. Make sense? Mm -hmm. If you push a statue down, what hits first? It depends on what side you push. Good point, but bang. And I remember why I was going through there and I heard someone say, Why did they chisel off all their noses? I just thought that was really funny. <laughs> And I said the French hate noses. Okay, the French hate the smell. Well, here's the thing. This is what you got to get down. I didn't put this out there. The French, I'm oh, sorry, not the French. The U.S. encouraged them. The U.S. encouraged all the countries behind the Iron Curtain to revolt, to become independent. And the United States promised, if you do this, we will come to your aid. We will send troops and help you. That's all that. Just the and you can open them. This is science. You turn back, look at me. Well, we're watching eight men out in special pockets about the 1990 black songs. So I went down so we could see, and then I forgot. And I look back. No, we have sun out there. Great one side. Yeah. So the U.S. promised we would help, and so they did it. Are we going to help? No. So while the world is distracted by the Suez crisis, the Soviets invaded Hungary to reestablish control, and they used countries of the Warsaw Pact. Those are actually Polish tanks. And look at the street fighter, the desperate Hungarians at the street of Budapest, throwing um, bricks. 
And there was a, uh, a radio station in Winnipeg, and they kept broadcasting out, where is America? We're waiting for the Americans. We're waiting for America. Come to our aid until the Russians finally took it. The Russians reestablished control. These are Soviet tanks barreling through. Basically, where they, there were some fires were, and they just took it out. And that's a Soviet tank and a Soviet uh, armored personnel carrier. And the U.S. did nothing. Sat back. And this is why this is so important. It shows the problem with brinksmanship. It shows the problem of talking tough against communism. We're going to destroy communism. We're going to fight for freedom. What happens if something big does really go on? Are we really going to have World War III and really the destruction of civilization for Hungary? When you talk tough, what did they call your bluff? What did they call it? The U.S. did nothing, and they are still upset in Hungary about this. That the United States promised to help and didn't. Talk to some Hungarians, go to Budapest, and they will tell you, yes. So we World War One because Germany the US did it. Well no. The world started World War One because we went through a tiny country called Belgium. But yeah. when a tiny country called Hungary gives them yeah. we can not. And so yeah, it shows the problem with this. So what happens if you do something that causes people to die and then you don't go help them? And what are you and people die. A thousand people died here. This will happen again in Iraq. Yeah, fortunately. Could have been a lot worse. But what else, Stalin? Enemy number one. By the way, this is a poll. This is a poster they put up for East, not with what is now East or what was said, East Germany. He is our friend. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved his whole children. No, he's all these propaganda. In 56, yes. This actually, I skipped a step here, but I want to do it all together with Sputnik. Stalin was dead. Stalin died in 1953, shocking everybody. The assumption was the man would live forever. Stalin will never die. In fact, the terror had begun, and there were mass arrests and mass executions and torture. Stalin had a stroke collapsed in his office right after his cronies left, all the members of the Politburo. They were all terrified of him. When he was discovered a few hours later, the guards were too afraid to call the police, because or the, a doctor. They were too afraid to call a doctor they thought it might be a trap. So when his leading aides and cronies came, they all were afraid to call a doctor because they thought Stalin might be tricking us. So almost 20 hours before they finally called the doctor at his stroke. My name is too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Why is it? 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 Why Because Stalin used to do things like, I am getting old. Maybe I should be quiet. And he would wait to see which one would be the first one to say, You're right. <laughs> oh. But wait, wait, if they go to doctor, that's the exact opposite. But they know. Uh, no one wants to be the first one to say Stalin is desperately ill. Maybe he can't govern anymore. That should give you an idea how terrified they were. Yeah. What if they like just didn't want to call the doctor? You know? Oh yeah, there was an element of that too. <laughs> because, and they all, uh, the, the six leading cronies all begin immediately to plot who's going to take over. And and the thing was Stalin was this horrible, brutal dictator. And so when he died, I mean, you could just imagine. What a big deal was. In fact, at a state funeral, there would be to try to get in to see it. Thousands of people from all over the Soviet Union came because Stalin was like their god, and thousands would be trampled to death trying to try to get someplace where they could see the body. So even in death, he took people with him. There would be a power struggle, and eventually, the leader of the Politburo, a man really nobody expected, would take power. Oh, I thought this was a funny cartoon. You were always a great friend of mine, Joseph. Um, Isn't that a good one? Yes. And then while I was looking for this, I found that Santa Claus, is Santa Claus really a totalitarian dictator? I mean, think about it. 
He knows what he wants. He's always watching. I don't know. It's pretty funny. I love the little kid. So, Stalin died in 1953. So, actually, it was Nikita Khrushchev, out of desperation, who ordered this. Now, Khrushchev, by the way, there would be a severe shortage of ages after Khrushchev became the premier of the Soviet Union. And. And he was he was not like the total leader, the absolute leader like Stalin was. It was still the whole Politburo, which is like a cabinet. He was like the first among equals. Never again would the Soviet Union have one leader who was extremely powerful. So now, but but this is Stalin, and or this is Khrushchev. He is very bombastic. Back to the UN one time to give a speech, he brought a shoe. So he beat the shoe on the podium. He did not take off his shoe. He was smart. He brought an extra shoe. But even though he was bombastic and trying to say that the Soviet Union, their economy would be so strong, we will bury the West, he wanted to end the Cold War. Does everyone got that? He wanted to end the arms race because it was breaking the Soviet system. They were going broke. If, if, if socialism was going to survive, they have to quit spending all their money on weapons. Yeah, with socialism and communism. If it's going to survive, they're going to have to reform it. He would get rid of the terror. Excuse me. And he even denounced Stalin. In 1950, he did it secretly in 56 and in 59, literally overnight. There were tens of thousands of statues, tens of thousands of statues of Stalin all over behind the Iron Curtain. Posters and painting on the wall all of them went down at once. It's almost impossible to find the statue of Stalin today. They destroyed them all. We're talking thousands of them. Denounced them and the terror as being detrimental to socialism. But we got to end the Cold War. That's part of the reason why we need to prove that the Soviet Union is powerful so we can negotiate with the United States as equals. So. Sputnik. In 1957, the Soviets would launch the first satellites, shocking the world. Sputnik. Everyone assumed like they did with the atomic bomb, that they were way behind. And boom, they did it. Now, Sputnik wasn't all that big. This is a mock-up of it, trying to show them working on it, but that's how big it was. A little bit bigger than a basketball. All it had in it was a little radio transmitter that beat and it flew in a really low orbit, so it eventually degraded and burned up in the atmosphere. Pretty fast, actually. But when they launched it, right here is the launch. That means they have a rocket that's strong enough to leave the atmosphere and get high enough to launch a satellite. That's if you have a rocket that can leave the atmosphere, and you have a rocket that can do what? It's Therefore, Wyoming is not vulnerable. <laughs> Put a nuclear weapon on it using a parabolic path, and hit the United States. And how do you defend yourself on the rocket? You have thirty minutes. Lasers, lasers, and particle beams. Which no? <laughs> it's like a bullet hitting a bullet. <laughs> so we can't really do that today unless we know exactly the path of it. So, which we don't. But this terrified people. And that's why I love this with him with Sputnik and the Kremlin's the crown. I think that's a pretty cool one. But now all of a sudden the Soviets look like they have this huge advantage. Look at what they have done. Now, at first, Eisenhower was like, not a big deal. It's just, congratulations to launch a rocket, but the United States is still very strong. But Eisenhower did not understand the panic. I miscalculated the fear of the United States. Because think of not only this propaganda victory, but it looks like a Russian victory. And not only the fear of a missile, the satellite orbit was so low that it was really easy to see at night as it went over the night sky over the United States. And if you had a ham radio, you could pick up the beat the radio transmitter would make. That's all I'm going to do. But Eisenhower, once he realized that, oh my goodness, not only are people afraid, but they're going to blame and the Republican Party. 
if we're going to get blamed for this, we better get a missile up there. Now, the United States was actually way ahead in rocket technology, but they're having some troubles with the stages to get up out of the atmosphere. And the other problem, we had a separate Army and Navy team working on the rockets. So they were in competition. And Eisenhower announced that the Navy team was ready to launch their rocket. And we want a satellite right away. So don't worry, we're right there. Nobody was more surprised by that announcement than the Navy. Navy. Anybody want to guess what happened? Let me show you a picture of what happened one second into the launch. It got 10 feet up and blew up. We look like idiots. Not only that, does anybody want to guess the newspaper headline? A bench of the United States would launch one called Explorer, but it looked like the Soviets are winning. And this would lead to two big things. First off, the Army and Navy team would be combined into NASA. Anybody know what NASA stands for? United States Administration. So they would work first, but you get a satellite, then a man into orbit. But the big thing NASA would do is for defense to perfect a rocket for an intercontinental ballistic missile and to get a satellite that could do what? Drop it. No. Uh, what? Transmit. Spy. Spy. You're on the right track, but yeah. And then, for the first time in American history, the federal government would begin to spend a little bit of money into public education because it looked like science technology was going past us. Here's the US, US science being blinded as Soviet science ran past. Get it? Kind of get it. Look, too complex. But a little bit of money into science and math for public education. This is always for states. And one thing you have to add the US avoided teaching science in schools. You remember back in 1925, the Skulls Monkey Trial about evolution? Everybody was afraid to touch it because it was that controversy. But now, let's start teaching science because of the Cold War. And this would begin the very small beginnings of aid, federal aid for education, which is still incredibly small. About 8% of public education money comes from the federal government. Yeah. Um, with NASA, didn't they also have plans or an operation called, I think, Star Wars, actually? But You're thinking about the eight. So, we're oh, right, right. Right. so we're not going to watch this. Oh. No, 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 that's tomorrow. No, tomorrow. No, sorry. Ike, though, had a goal. His legacy was to be a peacemaker. I mean, think about it for a second. He's the five star general who ended the arms race. And ironically, so did Khrushchev. And so even though Sputnik seemed to have flame tensions, hungry, actually, Khrushchev even made a state visit to the United States. He came there, was going to stay for a few days. That was a big deal. First time ever. A leader of Russia, let alone the Soviet Union, came to the United States. He ended up staying for two weeks. He went all the way across the United States. Here he is in Iowa looking at a cow. And then this is one of the great visits. I, I would have done anything to be there. That's Khrushchev at the brand new Disneyland. <laughs> that would have been something. That was one of the great trips. But it looked like the Cold War was, they, this is what they would have said, cooling down. I know, the cold, heating up was war. None of it really makes sense. Just go with me on that one. In fact, there was talk of a Paris summit where they would get together and have real arms control. Both sides even agreed to quit testing nuclear weapons. They put a moratorium. It looked like the Cold War was ending. This is going to be Eisenhower's great legacy. Years of fear, and now here's the warrior who brought peace. But there's a problem. Eisenhower would be blamed by a lot of more cold warriors and conservatives that he was giving into the Soviets. But Eisenhower knew something. He knew that the United States was actually way ahead, despite Sputnik. <clears throat> way ahead. It was secret, but he knew. He knew because of U2s. Anybody know what the U2 is? And U is just a distraction. U just meant utility to disguise what it really was. It is a plane that looks very much like a glider, and it can fly at about 60 to 65,000 feet. 
had a range of about 6,000 miles. And at, at that height, especially in the mid 1950s, it could fly way above Soviet air defenses. You know, it couldn't maneuver, but it was above Soviet planes could go and missiles. So they would fly that high, and their cameras were so precise at 65,000 feet, you could read the, the numbers on license plates from that high. And so they did over 1,000 illegal flights over the Soviet Union. He did? Wow. And they did what? <coughs> well, there were a lot, they actually took actually very active. They took um, not the test pilots, the actual ones who did it. They weren't like really good fighter pilots, but they're ones who had incredibly good stamina. Because they'd be in the plane for 12 hours. But if the Soviets ever did those kind of things to the United States, we would have lost our mind. But we did it over a thousand times with the Soviets. And then the Soviets would complain. Khrushchev was just furious about these flights. They could pick them up on radar. They got closer every year, but they couldn't quite get there. By 59, they were really close. And then we would say when the Soviets complained, typical Soviet dishonesty. We would never do that. They're the ones doing it. So we just lied to our team. But Khrushchev made it very clear at, in 1959, no Paris meeting if you keep doing these flights. So Eisenhower finally ordered the CIA, no more flights. No more flights. And Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, said, we need one more flight. Over Kazakhstan where they're testing rockets. Just one more. Just one more. Anybody want to guess what's going to happen? Do Francis Gary Powers, he does have me. This last flight, Soviet air defense by 1960 were getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And when he was 1,500 miles over the Soviet Union, there is almost the G suit, almost like a space suit, that's if they would get that high. His engine went out. He began to glide down, trying to restart the engine. At about 30,000 feet, he got to restart it just when his, they have sensors that will pick up when radar is tracking them, picked up a Soviet missile on the way. Now, these are really big missiles. They weren't designed to hit. They were designed to explode nearby, hopefully like shrapnel. Metal would tear apart the plane. Well, the U-2 has no maneuverability, so it exploded nearby, and the plane went down. They never expected a pilot to survive jumping out at 65,000 feet, so there was no ejector. You need an ejector seat to get out of the jet. Think about it. At high speed, you try to get out, and you're caught in the jet, it's like jet exhaust. So you need to be shot up. And CIA pilots were also given pistols before to shoot themselves. Because they weren't supposed to be taking their spies. Power somehow got out of the plane. This is him, his shoulder was severely dislocated and broke. That picture. Got pressure. He landed and then decided he wanted to live. No way. And so he was captured, really, by a couple farmers with pitchforks. <laughs> now he said, Wait a minute, here you go. What's he going to do? 1,500 miles in the Soviet Union. Wow. You know, take me to Wyoming. No. <laughs> and so he was captured. And at first, the United States brought this cover story. We're sorry, but a weather plane got lost and the, the poor crew. And the Americans said, no, or the Russians said, it's a spy plane. Typical Soviet lies. And they the brought out the wreckage and then the pilot and some of the films survived. I know the bell rang, but the last I want to make sure we got them. What do you think this did to the pair of these topics? No, no, no. And the Cold War actually heated up. All right, we'll see you. Yeah, and we had a quiz on. Is it Monday or Tuesday? Monday. On chapter 28, we do it tomorrow. Yeah. And those uh, practice tests. I did assign Russell chapter 28. And yesterday I assigned the first 30 pages of chapter 29. Moving fast. Tomorrow's Friday, everybody. We got a movie. Yeah. I'm going to ask. Find out. Oh, I have to ask you guys.